This next session will focus on manufacture, a sector extremely important to the Scottish economy and Scotland as a whole. More recently for the sector, development has focused on digital manufacture, Internet of Things and Industry 4.0 across a very wide range of manufacturing companies. We're going to hear from our colleagues Alistair Semple and Alex Campbell from Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service, and they'll talk about policy drivers and industry leadership respectively. Then we'll hear from Paul Sheeran, Scottish Engineering, and he'll discuss cross-sector collaboration from a manufacturer perspective. Within the ESP, our work has involved activity around attracting young people into the sector, and my colleague Wendy Finlay will tell us what ESP is doing with partners to inspire the future workforce. And then to finish off the session, uh, Rachel Tulloch from ESP will cover what we've been doing as a college response to support industry in advanced manufacture. Thank you, Roddy. Hi there, my name is Alistair Semple. I, along with my colleague Alex, who you'll hear from next, work for the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service, commonly known as SMAS. Due to the unique way that SMAS is, is funded through Scottish Economic Development Agencies, it means that we cover all sectors and all sizes of manufacturing businesses, and also we will cover all geographies. So you'll find some SMAS practitioners working up in Shetland, in Stirling, and all the way down in Selkirk. Because of how we're employed and the fact that we work directly with manufacturing businesses, we know the importance of clarity and understanding when it comes to industrial policy, as if we can communicate them well, and it allows businesses to align their capability to the policy. And in so doing so, it enables them to see the part that they can play and the changes that they will need to make. This is so important as when public and private stakeholders are aligned, what we can do is incredible. Last year, I saw this firsthand during the response to the pandemic. In March, the Scottish Government, via Minister Ivan McKee, wrote an open letter to Scottish companies requesting critical support for NHS Scotland. He asked companies to help source, manufacture and deliver critical supplies, outlining a list of seven priority items. Gowns was one such priority item, and I was lucky enough to be part of the team that helped establish the domestic supply chain. This process involved a great number of steps, such as sourcing the material and also engaging with the manufacturers, and then with all the stakeholders working together to create a design specification that could be manufactured and then undertaking all the required product testing. A project such as this under normal um, circumstances would have taken years, but with all the stakeholders working together and with a shared purpose, the supply chain took just under one month to set up and then went on to deliver over 1.4 million PPE gowns. Now, it could be argued that this wasn't an industrial policy, but I would say it meets the criteria, as an industrial policy is any type of government intervention that attempts to change the business environment or to alter the market activity, with the goal of businesses perhaps embracing a technology or carrying out a task that they wouldn't normally, and that these will offer better prospects for economic growth, reducing environmental impact, or improving societal welfare. The drivers of this activity were immediate and emotive, securing supply of items essential to the NHS, and also the outputs were concrete, seven critical items. We need to ensure that we consider this when communicating the drivers and outputs for advanced manufacturing. How can we give that same sense of urgency to the activity? And how can we articulate the emotive vision and the impact in a clear way that meeting these outcomes will have for all of us? The document which aims to do this and articulate the drivers and outcomes for advanced manufacturing is Making Scotland's Future, the government's recovery plan for Scotland's ma Scottish manufacturing, which was launched in June of this year. The drivers um, outlined in this document were first and foremost to boost the company's productivity and profitability so that they can not only weather the storm of the pandemic and the associated supply chain challenges, but take advantage of them in order to reshore manufacturing and become more attractive to foreign investment. Also helping to support the drive for manufacturers to modernise, in particular embracing digital transformation and low carbon methods of production. Doing all of this with fair work at its heart, Fair work being work that offers employees an effective voice, respect, security, opportunity and fulfilment. Finally, a driver which is not just important to Scotland, but the rest of the world as well. 
helping the fight with the climate emergency and as a sector cutting emissions to enable Scotland to meet its target of generating net zero emissions by 2045. If we do all this, we will be building towards the vision of Scotland becoming a centre of excellence for high value manufacturing, where companies employ highly skilled workers in knowledge intensive manufacturing operations to produce products with unique value in a sustainable and fair way. I will sign off by encouraging you to read Scotland's Manuf Making Scotland's Future to see where your business can take advantage of the large amount of work already underway. I will now hand you over to Alex, who will talk to you about the industrial leadership that this journey will require. Thanks, Alistair, and hello, everybody. My name is Alex Campbell also from the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service. And in this presentation on industrial leadership, I'm going to talk you through the eight steps of Cotter's change model. As I believe this is equally applicable to the transition to net zero as it is for any other change program. The first step is to increase urgency. Have the change as part of your strategy, yet really understand the reasons why you want to do it and also what the incentive is for the organization. If there's no incentive or more importantly, belief in what you're wanting to do, then the pace of change at best is going to be slow. The next step is about building coalitions, finding and empowering the right people to take this transition forward. Because as with any change program, engagement and empowerment of the right people is what it's all about. Next, it's about creating the vision. So the why has been established. It's now about understanding what the future looks like and how you're going to get there. Now there's no right route in order to do this and the route may change over time, but it's valuable to understand what you believe your priority areas to be and what are the biggest gaps that need to be filled. And this will cover numerous areas, including the products you make, the processes used to make them, your infrastructures that you have, and the technology that you use. Without this vision, then there'll be confusion, especially as transitioning to net zero means different things to different people, given how many areas that this can impact. The next step is about communication. So sharing the vision and the roadmap to get there with the entire organization, being clear with the reasons why these changes are going to happen, as well as your expectations, but also allowing for feedback and ideas from everyone. This will help ensure that there is alignment and everyone within the organization is facing in the same direction. Exactly like the diagram that Alistair had in the previous presentation on industrial policy. Without this clarity in place, then there, in, then there is a risk of false starts. The fifth step is enabling action. The key to the success of this is allowing people time to work on the activities that have been identified. And as a leader, your ongoing sponsorship to these activities is also critical. There is also a skills piece to bear in mind. So what skills currently exist within the organization? What skills are required to achieve the vision? And what training is needed in order to fill those gaps? Without the right skills in place, then this will lead to anxiety within the team. Please also bear in mind that this is not a journey that should be taken alone. There is a lot of support and advice available, and I would also encourage the sharing of best practice and experiences with other like-minded organisations. The value of seeing something relatable being done elsewhere is not to be underestimated. It is important to reinforce what has already been expressed by demonstrating a quick win and also to celebrate successes. This will also help establish buy-in to the change process. I recall one company saying how they refurbished the reception area of their organization when starting a major change program, meaning that the first standard that employees saw when arriving on site was a professional one. We are on to implementing and sustaining the change. And the seventh step of Cotter's change model is do not let up. There will be setbacks along the way and things that do not go according to plan. 
but learn from these mistakes and do something better as a result. Also, keep regularly communicating updates of progress to the organisation. Finally, make it stick and ensure that the changes are sustained over time, which is easier said than done. It's important to remember that this transition is not a one-off activity, nor something that happens overnight. But ultimately, as well as implementing the changes that are needed, there is also a mindset shift that is required too. So to finish by reinforcing some of the main points, get net zero transition on the agenda and make time to work on it. Empower and support the right people, but mostly really believe in the reasons for wanting the change. That will be the ultimate key to success. Well, hi everyone. Um, my name is Paul Sheeran. I'm Chief Executive of Scottish Engineering. I'm really glad to be here today talking about um, the topic of advanced manufacturing. I suppose the first place to start is that question. So what do we really mean by advanced manufacturing? Uh, it made me stop and think about it. And, you know, if I'm honest, um, first thing that comes into my head is a little bit of a stereotype and um, jump straight to the, you know, high value metal manufacturing. And I think that's certainly true. That's one of the aspects of, of um, advanced manufacturing. But in honesty, it's much broader than that. It's more widespread across um, all sectors and all categories. Um, so, you know, and I think even within an organization, it may be a description for a whole operation or it may be, you know, something that pertains to just one part of that operation. So it, it's definitely, um, you know, much broader than, and then we maybe first think about. Um, but it's definitely high value um, and it's equally something that usually is is about automation, although it may not be just physical automation. It could be use of data uh, for quality driven processes. Um, and as I said before, it goes across all sectors and categories. When you look at the definition that's more generally accepted, the thread that comes out through all of that is, is, it is about innovation. It's about innovation in the product manufacturing um, or it's innovation in the process to manufacture. Uh, and generally that's a, an agreed situation for it. So we know it's broad, we know it's high value, um, what else can we say about it? Well, probably useful to stop and talk about the challenges that, that, that we have for it just now. And none of you will be surprised to, to, to know that if you talk to industry, first and foremost, it's about skills. And skills I would categorize as, you know, our biggest challenge is volume of core skills. Um, and my argument for that is, is that core skills are the, the stepping stone to advanced manufacturing skills. Um, but having core skills means you're 80, 80 to 90 percent of the way there. Um, and if you know if you're not at that stage, then for industry, you're four away, four years away from from being that through modern apprenticeship or, you know, or even graduate apprenticeship uh, in that respect. Um, I think, you know, looking beyond that, um, this link to volume is really important. Um, volume of skills because I think quality has a, a, a kind of a link into that um, we talk about volume of skills but, but industry also talks about the quality of those skills but the quality of the skills in some ways is affected by that in that if you have the capacity to train in your organization at the kind of level that is needed it, it needs time it needs time it needs time to take people through not just the physical piece of what makes advanced manufacturing just that but also the wider meta skills piece, you know, around critical thinking, around communication, about the ability to apply logic in a way that allows you to get there differently. Again, coming back to that thread of innovation. I think um, um, beyond that, um, so that capacity thing really becomes important for volume core skills, core skills that are ready to be reskilled, upskilled, um, transformed into advanced manufacturing um, skills. And behind that, I think the other thing to 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 to, to pause on, I think, is is the capital cost. Uh, you know, sort of that entry barrier, the investment that needs to be made um, to get into to um, uh, advanced manufacturing. And that's interesting because if you go back to that definition of advanced manufacturing, innovation by its nature doesn't have to be about spending lots of money and lots of capital equipment. It can be about running a different race. That you know, the phrase creativity, creativity over capital very much ties with an innovative approach to that. But having said that, there is no doubt that you know some of those processes, automation, whether that's physical or data, um, 
you know, they're not free. Uh, and so there has to be, you know, th a thought about, about those barriers and how they got around. So there's creative ways to raise capital. Um, there's creativity over capital that I, I mentioned already. And I think the big one for us is about that. Before you go to spend money, you know that you're buying the right thing. And for me, that comes from collaboration. Collaboration with within the peer network, within within others who've got you know something that can be added to that. And um, you know, I think in Scotland under the NMIS umbrella, we're really lucky because there are elements within that, and there's more coming down the pipeline with 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 the NMIS headquarters and factor of the future um, concept within that. But I think there's also um, more networking and more benchmarking that can be done. People are really willing to open their doors and say, this is how we did it. This went well. This didn't go so well. Don't do the bits that didn't go so well and do more of the stuff that we learned along the way that works well. And I think this is a bit of a bite sized chunk, so I'm going to stop at that. And thanks for listening. Hi, my name's Wendy and I'm ESP's Programme Manager for STEM. We talked earlier about how ESP has been involved in Scotland's STEM strategy since its inception and how Scotland has broken down into 13 different STEM regions, identifying that the needs in the Highlands are not the same as the Borders or Glasgow. The leads for these 13 partnerships get together quarterly to discuss their challenges, but also to share best practice. And if activities worked well in one region, it may not need much adaptation to work well elsewhere. But at ESP, we also try and identify national activities which can work well anywhere. One of our example of this is the IET First Lego League, which has 13 different age, sorry, three different age groups. Discover for four to six year olds, explore for six to nine year olds and challenge for nine to 16 year olds. This, uh, as with all STEM activities, allows people to develop skills whilst understanding a little bit more about job opportunities in the world of work. So in Lego League, they learn communications and uh, presentation skills. They learn to work together as a team. They learn to plan a project as well as learning to design and code a robot. Um, I'm just going to play a short video, which will give you a flavour for this activity. The first Lego League, um, ESP has been running this for about four years and you can see how we've managed to expand this all across Scotland. And we've actually managed for to, to gain some funding at Explore level, which will reach out into Orkney, Shetland and Lanarkshire this year. Some other activities we, we have run can be seen on the slide here. Um, but we talked about how it's important that young people, as well as having fun, learn a little bit about how the skills they're learning can apply to a future job. So the Big Bang Science and Engineering Fairs, we themed those and run them through the colleges and they're called Step Into Activities. Um, so we, the first one that we ran was Step Into Renewables for the Dundee and Angus area, where we got some young people to do short snippets of their job in the renewables industry why they liked their job, why they would recommend it, and the, the subjects that they studied to get there. This was so successful that we then expanded it um, for the northeast of Scotland and interviewed people who work in the supply chain. We were asked because of young people's interest, uh, increased interest in science due to the pandemic to do a step into science equivalent, and we launched this just back in August. Our next endeavour um, that we're looking to recruit people to talk now will be step into robotics in January. 
You can see from the slide here, this is how it looks on the ESP website and on YouTube where it's also available. So you click on, you get a little bit of background about the sector and you click on an icon and you hear a short video from someone who works in that sector. But why is it important that we do STEM engagement? Well, as you can see from the graph here, technology is moving at an ever increasing rate. Not enough young people are studying STEM subjects to meet the demand for technical skills. It's crucial that we inform young people and their influencers, such as parents and teachers, that STEM skills are transferable and will benefit them throughout their careers. We need to inform and inspire them in order to ensure that Scotland continues to compete at the forefront of technology and design. Thank you. Good afternoon. So we've heard from Alistair, Alex and Paul how innovation and skills are vitally important in advanced manufacture. Publications such as Making Scotland's Future and the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan that we heard about in an earlier session highlight how manufacturing can directly support the transition to net zero. Wendy has told you how we're encouraging and inspiring the future workforce into advanced manufacturing and I'm now going to tell you a bit about how ESP are working with the college sector to ensure that Scotland has the right skills to meet industry needs. In 2014, ESP's remit was extended to cover manufacture. In 2016, this was further extended to cover wider manufacture, including food and drink, textiles and chemical and life sciences. This was after the launch of the Manufacturing Action Plan. In January 2019, we held a advanced manufacturing conference with all our colleges attending as well as industry and our advanced manufacturer training network was formally launched by Jamie Hepburn MSP who was then the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills. This basically merged the wider manufacturer training networks and had a renewed focus on advanced manufacturing technologies such as Internet of Things, automation and robotics, Cobots, 3D printing, digital twinning. So as part of our advanced manufacturer training network, we embarked on a series of learning journeys, first and foremost with senior college staff and then with delivery staff. This involved collaborating with industry to bring emerging technologies to the colleges. We visited Aqualife, we visited the Advanced Forming Research Centre out at Inchinnan. We had a discussion from Beckhoff and also visited their facilities. We went down to Omron's facilities and had them in to talk to our training networks. We visited Peacock Technology. We had Siemens up for a visit um, with a demonstration of some of their equipment and we had a visit to SP Automation and Robotics in Dundee. So overall, in excess of 140 college staff have been supported through CPD activities. We've also collaborated with other partners such as SMAS and Census. While we've been working with SMAS, we've been looking at scaling up a project called Digital Manufacturing on a Shoestring um, throughout Scotland. This is aimed at finding low cost digital solutions to help with the journey into advanced manufacture. So it's based around potentially smaller businesses that might not have too much of a budget to spend on expensive equipment. We're basically working with the colleges to see if we can come up with a low, a low cost solution. We've also done a number of sessions with census they basically demonstrate that there's some really quite low cost solutions out there in terms of sensors and again this is all about encouraging college staff to maybe think outside the box a bit and, and use some of these low cost off the shelf solutions and be innovative so as well as working with the industry to upskill and deliver cpd to lecturing staff we've also de developed Sorry, we've also developed some curriculum for the colleges to use. So Rachel, you've told us a bit about ESP's Advanced Manufacturer Training Network, and as we've just heard, you also led on our PDA project. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that. 
and what may DSP decide to develop curriculum and advance manufacture? Yeah, so we had a number of conversations with our industry partners and there was no current provision within engineering on advanced manufacturer qualifications. So really what we wanted to do, we were looking to enhance the existing engineering awards um, to be used for upskilling and reskilling staff. We were aware of an upcoming SQA review of engineering, so we felt that this was an ideal time to focus on advanced manufacturer qualifications. And how did you decide which awards and topics to develop? So again, this was with discussion with our industry partners. What came out quite naturally was two different PDAs, one in advanced manufacture and the other in industrial automation. The other thing that came out was the need for computer programming and data security as an option to all engineering awards. So we recognise that most future engineering would require an element of both of these. So we spoke to SQA and we had those added as an option to the existing engineering awards. And can you tell us what the process was for developing these awards? Yep, so we held a development workshop with our um, engineering colleges. We looked at some existing units that were actually in the computing side and we realised that we probably needed to develop a new unit specifically for advanced manufacturing technologies. However, for the rest of them, there were existing units out there. So we called on specialists within our engineering colleges to help us develop the learning and teaching materials for each unit. We used a collaborative approach to this and we actually used Microsoft Teams in the main, um, which was the first time we'd done it on this scale with colleges. And this was actually pre-COVID. Um, what that meant is actually when COVID came along, we were able to continue with the development work. So we ended up with two new awards, professional development awards or PDAs. We had the Advanced Manufacturing Technologies and that had units in it such as CAD 3D printing and scanning, Internet of Things and we also had this new unit Advanced Manufacturing Technologies. We also had a choice of two optional units um, for candidates to pick one or colleges to pick one to deliver and they were Artificial Intelligence and Robotic Systems. The second award was a PDA in Industrial Automation and that looked at applications of PLCs, computer programming and engineering systems interface with PLCs. They, that also had the two optional units of robotic systems and artificial intelligence. So where we are now is that all of the colleges within ESP's network can deliver these two professional development awards to industry and they are available for upskilling and reskilling. Thanks very much, Rachel, and thanks to everybody who took part in our sessions this afternoon, and I hope you've enjoyed these, these sessions and found them informative. Thanks,